Alhamdulillah, um, uh, I can say that I'm, I'm very pleased to be back with you guys, honored actually to be back with you, uh, our Bermuda family here again. Alhamdulillah, thank you for inviting me back. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I pray that uh, inshallah ta'ala for the, the time that we have together tonight and tomorrow that uh, we can learn from one another, benefit from one another, inshallah ta'ala. So uh, my discussion tonight with you guys were, was supposed to be or is related to the roles and responsibilities of the fathers, sons, and husbands. And seeing as though um, that, that topic is, is kind of broad, you know, for, for me to go into uh, all of the responsibilities of the fathers, the husbands, um, I wanted to kind of uh, take a detour through that, still related, still connected, um, but not necessarily getting into the particulars of uh, the roles and responsibilities of the husband, father, and son. I think that the husband, father, and son all have um, one thing in common, and that is that it is uh, their duty to be men, right? That's the one thing that they all have in common, fathers, sons, and husbands. I think the one thing that all three of them have in common is that uh, the expectation is for them to be men, at least um, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the role of the father, the role of the husband, the role of the son, there are certain, there's a thread that connects all three of them. And I, I want to take a time out tonight to kind of explore what it means to be a man. So just by a show of hands, how many of us in the room were raised without a father? Okay. Okay. That, that's a significant amount. Even if one person raised their hand, that's a lot. How many was raised with a father, but the father did not necessarily show you everything that you needed to know in order to be a responsible man as you grow up? Okay, so more hands go up. So although the father was there in the home, doesn't necessarily mean that and that doesn't mean that it's a, it's a negative, it's not a negative reflection on your father. This is not a criticism. But I want those of us who raise our hands to be aware that along our journey into adulthood, there were some things that we were missing. Some pieces to the puzzle that was missing. And considering that um, boys, you know, require a man present, you know, in their development, in order for them to be able to see and model the behavior of a man in their own lives. And in the absence of that, then there are some pieces missing to that puzzle. All right? So when we consider the sad state of many of our male children, as well as many young men and older men in our communities, uh, we should see the importance of having a male role model to exemplify the qualities of a man. And as being a man is not a natural occurrence, you don't just become a man, right? Uh, rather, it's something that is acquired through a process of observational learning. We watch men interact. As the Prophet وسلم, you know, he used to bring some of the younger Sahaba around him, right? On one occasion, he brought Abdullah bin Abbas, uh, uh, excuse me, he brought Abdullah bin Umar to a gathering with amongst the Sahaba, and he asked the Sahaba, does anyone know uh, the tree? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens the believer to a tree in the Quran. He said, does anyone know what that tree is? And some of them said, is this tree, that tree? And Abdullah ibn Umar said, it, it, was the lo it, it is the date palm tree. And when he met Umar, his father, later on that day, he said, you know, the Prophet brought me into this gathering with the elders, and asked me a question, and you know, I was a little too shy to answer the question, but I knew the answer. And Omar said that it would have been more beloved to me and dear for me, dear to me, for you to have answered that question in front of everybody, because that's his son. You want everybody to see that his son is around the Prophet and learning. 
On another occasion, Umar anhu, he brought Abdullah bin Abbas in a, in a gathering with some of the elders, the OGs from the Sahaba, right? And the Sahaba kind of took issue with Umar and he said, you know, we have Lana Aulad Mithnahu. We have children his age. Why are you bringing him amongst, you know, the elders? And Umar said, does anyone know what the meaning of Surah Al Nasr is? Does anyone know what that surah means? So the Sahaba began speculating. Some said that it means that Islam is going to be victorious. Some said it means that Islam, you know, many people are going to enter into Islam in droves. And then Umar turns to Abdullah bin Abbas, who's, you know, a teenager at that time. And he says, tell me, oh young boy, what this surah means. And Abdullah bin Abbas, he said, this surah means the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is getting ready to die. Sahaba looked, what is he talking about? And Omar said, Wallahi, I don't know anything about that surah except what he just said. That's, that's what I know the surah to mean. And Ibn Abbas said, I saw that Omar only did that because he wanted to show the elders, the OGs from the Sahaba, that I was someone that was eventually going to be a person of knowledge. So as you can see, and there, there are many examples, you know, even Um Sulaim, the mother of Anas ibn Malik, when the Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina, Umm Sulaim, you know, Anas' father, Malik ibn Nadr, he didn't convert to Islam with her. And unfortunately, he was eventually killed, and that left Umm Sulaim as a single mother. The Prophet ﷺ migrates from Mecca to Medina, and Umm Sulaim goes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, I don't have a house for you to stay at, but here's my son, Anas, take him. And let him stay with you for as long as you need him to. She knew that he needed to be around a man. She was a new convert to Islam. Her ex-husband did not convert to Islam. Ennis' father did not convert to Islam and was eventually murdered, leaving her as a single mother. And she knew that this was an opportunity for her son to not just be around a man, any man, but to be around the men, the man of men. And that was the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Uswatun Hasana, the greatest example for all mankind. As a matter of fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his character the standard of character, of all character. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed you have in the Messenger of Allah, Uswatun Hasana, an exemplary example. Innaka la'ala khurukin azim. Indeed, you, O Muhammad, are on an exalted standard of character. And this was after they called him a liar, kithab. they called him a soothsayer, they called him sahir, they called him a magician, they called him majnoon, called him crazy, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deflected all of that by saying, innaka la ala khudukin alim, you are on an exalted standard of character. Don't, don't worry about what they're saying. Allah in another ayah said, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ And your companion is not crazy, he's not this, now where are you going to go? Here you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, defending the character of the Prophet sallallahu So this is who Umm Sulaim wanted her son to be around. And as Anas mentioned, that he stayed around the Prophet sallallahu for 10 years. He said, I lived with the Prophet sallallahu for 10 years. And this man never once said to me, oof. Never once said to me any words of disapproval for something that I did. Never criticized me for something that I did. Nor did he ever question me about something that I didn't do. He let me make my mistakes. Because that's how men learn. Some men like to play it safe when they're in their youth. Parents like to keep children in a bubble in their youth. And then what ends up happening is that they become old fools. You'd rather be a young fool than an old fool any day. That means that you make your mistakes when you're young, so you don't have to deal with those mistakes when you get older. Because one way or another, you are going to make mistakes. Boys are risk takers. We like to gamble. We like to take risks. That's part of our makeup. That's part of our predisposition as men. And you would much rather take risks when you have the luxury to do so than to wait until you have, you're married with children and you got people looking, you know, resp you're responsible for, 
people that are looking, you know, for you to take care of them, for you to protect them, for you to make those same risky mistakes or behaviors at that time. So you much rather be a young fool than an old fool. Even an old fool, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the old fool accountable more than he holds the young fool accountable. Did you know that? The Prophet sallallahu said, there are three people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will neither look at them on the day of judgment, nor will he speak to them, and nor will he purify them for their sins, and for them is a painful punishment. One of those three is Shaykh Zanin, is an elderly person who still fornicates, still commits fornication. There's no excuse for this person because he should know better. <laughs> Fornication is something that is prevalent, characteristic of young men who have no self-control. Not of an older person who has reached the point of a sheikh, uh, you got gray in your beard, and you're still walking around calling somebody your girlfriend. Like, come on, man. That's stuff that you do when you're 15, 16, 17 years old, not what you do when you're 40, 41, 43, 45, 50. Not to mention, you know, between 60 and 70 is our departing period. The Prophet وسلم, he said that the, mo the bulk of my ummah will not go past the, 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 the average age of my ummah is between 60 and 70. And only a few go beyond 70. The Prophet وسلم, died at 63. Abu Bakr died at 63. It's the great men. So Boys learn how to be men through observational learning uh, and seeing a man in the home and duplicating and emulating the behavior that he observes. In the absence of a man in the home or manly qualities in the home, uh, boys grow to become men physically but not mentally and emotionally. I'll say that again. When a boy does not observe the character of a man in the home. He eventually transitions from a child into a man physically, biologically, but not mentally and emotionally. You guys follow me? So then you have grown men, 25, 28, 30, 35, but he still has the emotional capacity of a teenager, teenage boy. He gets mad. He throws things. He threatens his wife, threatens his mother, because he can't get his way. That, that's not an emotionally stable man, because he's missing out on some of those qualities that he should have gotten when he was younger. Um, so one of the things that we want to look at today, inshallah ta'ala, is manhood, and what makes a man a man. Manhood is determined not by the external factors of brute strength, physical prowess, physical features, facial hair, you know. This is not what makes you a man. However, we have to realize that most of the qualities that make a man a man, or justifies his title as a man, they're more internal than they are external. Would you guys agree with that? Anybody disagree with that? I want our young men to, to pay attention to this, especially those of you who are listening. If you guys are at home, you guys at home, and you have young boys, young children, young males, bring them in the living room and let them hear this. Especially sisters that are home, you have young men at home with you that you are trying to beat this into their heads and it just doesn't seem like they're getting it. Bring them in the living room, Turn on the Periscope, turn on the, the Instagram Live, Facebook Live, and let them listen to this here. The qualities that are internal are the qualities that are connected to our moral fiber, which is affects the way that we think, which in turn affects the way that we act, which ultimately is the driving force behind the way that we navigate through life. And those are the things that, you know, demonstrate to everyone that we are actually a man. So, let's look at the first quality that makes a man a man. 
and that is mesuliya. Responsibility. Being responsible is at the top of the list of the things that makes a man a man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a clear distinction between the two, gen the two genders of male and female in the Quran by giving one more responsibility than the other, not solely based upon gender as, solely, as some believe, but based upon the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prepping the male to be different than the female. Very famous ayah that many of us are familiar with that we, you know, cite and quote all the time is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, Ar-rijalu kawamuna ala nisa bima faddul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bihi ba'dhubum ala ba'd. Excuse me. That men are the protectors and maintainers of women. Pay attention to why. Not just because they're men. And some of us think that by default of being a man, that I'm deserving of all of these great things. No, there's a certain criteria that you have to meet in order to be deserving of the status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. He said that men are the protectors and maintainers of women because of the virtue that Allah has given one over the other, and because men are responsible with their wealth, they spend from their money to maintain their women. So the man who does not fulfill this responsibility uh, does not deserve the status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him in the marriage. <laughs> I wear contacts, so it's kind of dry in here. All right? So the man that is not fulfilling this responsibility is not deserving. So let, let me paint a picture for you. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that men are the protectors and maintainers of the women, kawama, in order for you to protect and maintain someone, you have to protect and maintain yourself. Before you can be responsible for someone else, you have to be responsible for yourself first. And, I mean, like, does anybody disagree with that? How can you maintain somebody and your entire life is a mess? The maintenance starts with you as a man. Your affairs are in order. Your life is in order to some degree, in order for you to step into somebody else's life and maintain somebody else's life. I don't understand why that doesn't make sense, that doesn't register with many of us. And when I say us, I mean just Muslim men in general. And then he said because of the, the fuddle, the virtue, the bounty that Allah has given one, the strength that Allah has given one over the other, and because the man spins from his wealth. So how does a man come home from prison and feel like he's entitled to get married? How does a man sit behind the walls of a prison cell and believe that he is entitled to get married? And then when someone tells you, no, I'm not going to marry you, wait until you come home and then let me see how you fare as, as, as a responsible adult. And then it's like, well, this is my right. The entitlement. This is not a right that is given to you just by default of being a male. This is a title that is given to you once you earn it. The Prophet ﷺ married a man to, married a woman to a man, and he told the man, go find an iron ring, even if it's made of iron, brass, worthless, but you're going to give her something. And then he married a woman to a man from what he memorized from the Quran. We come out, fucking, mind the chain. You don't have no, how much Quran you memorize, brother? Even if we apply the Prophet Wasallam's method that I'm going to marry you to this woman, you don't have any money, you don't have any place to live, I'm going to marry you to this woman based upon what you've memorized from the Quran. How much of the Quran have you memorized, brother? You've been in prison for how long? Five years? Ten years you've been in prison? How much Quran have you memorized? 
You'd be good if he says he got Juz Amma memorized. Which is the th last 30th Juz of the Quran, the shortest Juz in the Quran. It contains the shortest surahs in the Quran. And you'd be good to find out that he has the whole Juz memorized. Yet, it's his right to be married. You have not earned the right to be married. You are not, you haven't proven that you are responsible. Take it a step further. Even if we marry a man to a woman like this, she's going to make fun of him. She's not going to respect your so-called manhood. She's going to look at you and don't women say things like, and you call yourself a man, right? This is what women will say to you. They will clown you, right? The Prophet ﷺ, he said to a woman by the name of Fatima bin Duqais, she came to him and she said, Khatabani Muawiyah wa Abu Jahm. She said, Muawiyah proposed to me, Ibn Abi Sufyan, and Abu Jahm proposed to me. Which one should I marry? The Prophet ﷺ said, Amma Muawiyah fa sa'iluk la ma la la. He said, as for Muawiyah, he's poor, don't marry him. And some of us would be offended if the Imam said that about you. You don't know my financial status. How could you say that? No, man, dude, you don't have a job. I, what did you want me to say to the woman? You want, wanted me to just totally uh, uh, omit that? You wanted me to lie by omission? You wanted me to just overlook that? And now somehow you got an issue with me because I told the woman that you were broke, you didn't have enough money to get married? So when we cite the hadith, as many men like to use the hadith of, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu married the woman to the man because of what he had memorized of the Quran. But also, he also stopped the man from marrying a woman, or stopped the woman from marrying a man because he didn't have any money. And this was Muawiyah. This, don't you know that Muawiyah was one of the, his scribes, his kutab? He was one of the scribes that wrote the Quran down. Did you know that? So if anyone was going to be given a pass, it would have been one of, you know, if I had to use modern vernacular, it would have been one of his young boys. Muawiyah was one of his young boys. However, the Prophet ﷺ intervened because he knew that Muawiyah marrying a woman without any money, he would probably be setting him up for failure. That would destroy you. That would destroy a young man marrying a woman with no money and she's paying all the bills. That'll break him because she's going to make fun of you. She's not going to respect you. And you're going to, a man is going to walk away from that situation thinking all women care about his money. All women are like this or all right or wrong. They're going to be scarred. When in fact, that's not the case because if you would have went into that relationship financially stable enough to maintain a woman, you would never have to worry about her complaining about your manhood. So intervening in that sense was a benefit for him as a young man. And men do it all the time and they don't understand you are about to destroy yourself. Especially, you, and the thing I find ironic is that sometimes you will find the brothers who are struggling financially and you want to marry the prettiest woman who, you know, she, she requires maintenance, man. This ain't, you know, this ain't your, you know, oodles and noodles type of chick, you know, this is your, you know, she wants steak lobster, you know, she, she's one of those type of girls. Prada bags, Gucci bags, and you know, it, you know, why is it that, you know, the brokest guys want the, the, the high maintenance women? Like, why don't you settle for a woman that's low maintenance and, you know, you save yourself the headache? You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like the relationship that was between Zainab and Tujahash and Zayn. Ibn Haditha, you know, he was, a, he was a slave whose freedom was purchased. He was given the nickname, the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibn Muhammad, right? But he was still not of the higher status. Zainab come from the upper echelons of society. And the Prophet Sallallahu married Zayn to Zainab and, you know, suffice it to say, that situation didn't work out. Zainab was the same woman who used to brag to the other wives of the Prophet Sallallahu that your fathers married you to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Allah married me to the Prophet from above the heavens. I'm better than y'all. This is the type of woman she was. You understand? 
because Allah had revealed the ayah about the Prophet ﷺ marrying her. So, you know, keep that in mind. You know, when you are lacking in the qualities that validate, you know, or substantiate the title husband or kawam or maintainer, then you don't deserve that. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun ar-ra'iyatihi All of you are shepherds and all of you are responsible for your flocks. He said, Ar-rajlun ra'in wa mas'ulun an ahli baytihi A man is responsible for his household. Here again, that word responsibility. That word responsibility. And with responsibility comes accountability. With responsibility, comes accountability. The Prophet said, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ اسْتَرْعَاهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى الرَّعِيَةِ ثُمَّ يَمُوتُ يَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَهُوَ غَاشٍ لِرَعِيَتِهِ إِلَّا لَمْ يَدْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمْ يُرِحْ رَائِحَةِ الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet said, there is no man, pay attention to the hadith, there is no male servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala اسْتَرْعَاهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى الرَّعِيَةِ that Allah makes him responsible over a family. Except that the day that he dies, he has not fulfilled the rights of that family, except that he will not smell the fragrance of Jannah. With responsibility comes accountability. And you can think that standing up at night, making tahajjud, begging Allah for forgiveness, and praying, and you can think that will make all of your problems go away. I'm sorry, it doesn't. It doesn't. You have hukuk, you have rights that you owe to other people. That's not something to play with, Yom al -Qiyamah. The first things that Allah will judge between people on the Day of Judgment is blood, honor, and wealth. People who you've spilled blood, people who you've destroyed their honors, and people who you owe money to. That includes husbands who don't take care of their families, fathers who don't take care of their children. They are included in that. Why do we exclude them from that? These are people who have debt. These are the first categories of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge on the Day of Judgment. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said these three things were sacred. كُلُّ مُسْلِمْ لِلْمُسْلِمْ حَرَامٌ مَالُهُ وَدَمُّهُ وَعِرْضُهُ That the whole of a Muslim to another Muslim is haram, is sacred, his wealth, his honor, and his blood. So with responsibility comes accountability. And this is the whole objective of responsibility. For responsibility without accountability would, mean, would be worthless. I mean, the responsibility doesn't mean anything. Because there's no accountability behind it. And this quality cannot manifest itself except if it's a, a, when a person is entrusted with something and they prove to be responsible. How do we know that somebody is responsible? They have to prove that they are responsible. And this is why most parents don't get a chance to see whether, whether or not their children are responsible until they give them a responsibility, give them something that tests, that proves to them whether their child is responsible or not. Child gets a license, you let the child use your car, and the child is driving with no seatbelt on, on the phone, gets in a fender bender, the child has proven that they are irresponsible. You tell the child, you can go out, I need you back home by this particular time. That time rolls around, the child is not walking through the door. And then the child has a million and one excuses for why he or she could not be back in the house at the time that you agreed upon. The child has proven to be irresponsible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms this in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayat 6. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pay attention to this ayat. He says, وَبَتَّلُوا الْيَتَامَ حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاحِ فَإِنْ آنَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ آنَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ رُشْدًا فَادْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَبْتَلُوا Test the orphans Test the orphans Those of you who have orphans in your home Test them 
hatta idha balaghu nikah until they reach the age of puberty and notice allah said the age in the arabic he says balaghu nikah you, they reach the age of marriage, the marriage age, meaning they reach the age of puberty, where they are ready, they start to recognize that they need to be in relationships with one another. If you see that they are responsible, then give them the money that they, they are due. Meaning, if an orphan, meaning the parents of the orphan, right, the father dies, leaves behind these children, but also leaves these children money. You take these children in, you raise them as your own. You do not give the children the money that their father left for them until you test them over and over again until you find that they are responsible. When you see that they are responsible, then Allah says, فَدْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ Then give them the money that their father left behind for them. You, you follow me? But we don't give it to them until we are sure that they are responsible. And there are many of us, we buy our children cell phones. The child, we find that the child is looking at porn, the child is looking at things that are inappropriate. We take the phone back and we do not give the phone back until the child has proven to us that they can be responsible with the cell phone. You look on a child's Instagram page, Facebook page, you see that they are posting things that are inappropriate. You close the page down as the parent, and they are not allowed to open up another page until they are proven to you that they can be responsible. They have to prove that they are responsible. Why can't we apply the same concept as it relates to brothers and sisters getting married in the masjid, I'm, I'm almost positive that if we were to apply this, we could decrease the amount of divorces that go on in our communities. We are just marrying people. We don't care if they're responsible, irresponsible. We can care less. We revel in the fact that, mashallah, this brother and this sister got married, and then six months later, they're divorced. We want... Brothers, sisters, we have daughters in our homes and we know they don't clean, they don't cook, they don't clean their own room, they don't wash their own clothes, they don't clean up the dishes, they don't clean the kitchen. Domestic duties, zero. And we are looking for a brother to marry our daughter. For what? So you can, so she can get sent back home within eight months, she's divorced? For what? Why would you be looking for somebody to marry your daughter? Because for many of us, marriage is a safe haven. If I get my daughter married, inshallah, she'll be okay. You didn't win. As a matter of fact, you're going to create more problems for yourself. Our children have to prove that they are responsible, just as responsibility is part of being an adult, part of being a man, is being responsible. Salamna, can we all agree to, to that? Yeah, yeah. All right? And responsibility, it has its, you know, it, it has its traits and characteristics, proving that we've been responsible with certain things. All right? And as I said before, if there is no accountability with responsibility, then anybody could say that they are a man. <laughs> anybody could say that they are a man. As the scholars of Hadith say about the Hadith, uh, say about the Isnad, the chain of narration, لَوْلَا الْإِسْنَادِ لَقَالَ مَنْ شَاءَ مَنْ شَاءَ لَقَالَ مَنْ شَاءَ مَا شَاءَ That if it wasn't for the Isnad, connecting the, the, the text all the way back to the narrator, if it wasn't for the Isnad, then anybody could say whatever they wanted to say. <laughs> you understand? So if it's not for accountability, then any man could claim he's a man. If there's no sin, no responsibility, any man could claim to be a man. But the fact of the matter is that you are irresponsible. Number two, from the qualities that make a man a man, is prioritizing. And if we had to look at that in terms of, I'm talking about responsibility, if we had to look at that in terms of a husband, a father, and a son, they all have that in common, that they all have responsibilities. A son has a responsibility to his mother, to his father. The 
husband has a responsibility to his family, and the father has a responsibility to his family, his children. All right? So all of them have that in common. Number two, prioritizing. Prioritizing means to put things that are more important before the things that are important. And this also is aligned with being responsible. This is part of being responsible, is learning how to prioritize. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found fault with Bani Israel because they chose things that the earth produced instead of the things that Allah gave them. Allah bestowed upon them manna wa salwa, quails, and selwa, which is, was a type of fruit, halawa, that Allah sent down upon them. And rather than reveling in the fact that Allah gave them that, they wanted what the earth produces. They want lentils, they want onions, they want min basliha wa kithaiha to the end of the ayah. And it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa, Musa says to them, Will you trade that which is greater than for that which is less than? This is prioritizing. Learning, learning how to give importance to what is more important over what is important. We're not dismissing anything. We're not saying that something is not important. But we're saying that there are things that are far more important. Right? In the Arabic language, in the, the scholars of fiqh, they say, taqdim al-muhim uh, al -muhim. Giving precedence to what is more important over the things that are important. And one of the things that help us to prioritize our lives as men is being married, having children. We can no longer be reckless, not with money, not with our time, right? We realize that, you know, we have to prioritize. Your friends say, hey, let's go hang out for a little bit. We pray Isha, let's sit around and talk. You know that your wife and your children are waiting for you to come home so they can eat. Your wife does not like to eat without you. And we'll delay it. Your wife is texting you, you're like, I I'll be there, give me a few minutes. And you're giving precedence to what is important. Yeah, talking with the brother is important. <clears throat> but going home to your family is more important. And sometimes, as men, we get conflicted with that. But being married and having children, having people depend on you, uh, helps us to prioritize. But it is also dangerous. Because as a man, sometimes we like to fulfill our family's every right. All right? And because of their dependency on us, it creates sometimes a conflict between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and what they want. So sometimes we give precedence to what our families want over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once, which is why Allah warns us in the Quran, in Surah number 64, ayah 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduwa lakum fahdharuhum, wa in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taqfiru, fa inna allaha ghafuru rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pay attention to this ayah, very important. He said, O you who believe, he's talking to the men, Indeed, amongst your women, in the men, not all women, right? Allah always leaves room for the exception to the rule. In the men, from amongst your wives, and from amongst some of your children, they are enemies to you. Be aware of them. But if you pardon and overlook and forgive, then indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafur rahim forgiving and merciful, meaning to you. The scholars of tafsir, they explain this ayah by saying, An-nafs majboolatun ala mahabbat al-azwaj wal awlad. The man, the, the, soul, the, 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 the soul of the man is naturally inclined towards loving his wives, his children. Men love their wives and their children. He said, and considering the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us not to obey our wives and our children when it involves disobeying Allah, we have to put Allah first. 
So if your wife says, yeah, but I want to move into this house. But this house requires you to go take a loan from the bank. You want your wife to live in a nice house. You want her to be comfortable. But you also don't want to fall into a situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wages war against you for taking interest. So now you're caught between a rock and a hard place. And sometimes we give in to our wives' desires. Sometimes we give in to the desires of our children. And in giving in, we put ourselves at odds with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here again, giving precedence to what is important over what is more important. And so, because a man usually wants to obey or wants to, you know, respond to his wife and his children, it may cause us to, you know, it may conflict with our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are told to put obedience to Allah first. But... If you think about that, someone could probably think that this also entails being harsh or being, um, you know, unforgiving, lacking in understanding with our family. So Allah ends the verse by saying, be aware of them. When you pardon them, because you understand that's, you know, they, they, that's what they want. When you overlook. You don't hold it against them. وَتَغْفِرُوا And you forgive them. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ Then Allah is forgiving and merciful to you. Meaning if you pardon them, Allah will pardon you. How you deal with your family is exactly how Allah will deal with you. If you pardon them, Allah will pardon you. If you overlook their faults and mistakes, Allah will overlook your faults and mistakes. If you forgive them, then Allah will, subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. And the religion of Islam as a whole teaches us to prioritize. You know, Salat al-Fajr, Salat al-Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, the five Salat teaches us how to prioritize. The Prophet ﷺ also epitomized the concept of prioritization. If you remember when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, pay attention. And I want women to understand that men, we love our wives and our children, but sometimes we have to say no. And as painful as that is, because, you know, when you say no and your wife gives you that look, you know, she starts to pout, right? You hurt because you, you have to say no. And there's some men who don't want to see that face. So they always tell them yes. Even when you don't want to. Even when you know you shouldn't. You still say yes. And let me share something with you, brothers. And, and many of you in here are old, a lot older than me, a lot wiser than me. And I'm sure what I'm getting ready to say is nothing more than a reminder to you. Some women actually appreciate you when you say no. Why? Because no means that you actually give a damn. You actually care. If you say yes to everything, that means that you don't care. You don't care. You want to go out 10 o'clock at night? Sure, go ahead, enjoy yourself. You want to go out without your hijab on tonight? Put on some makeup? You know, hey, matter of fact, let me fix your, let me pull your hijab off for you. Pull it back a little bit more, honey. I mean, like, subhanAllah. Some men are okay with that. But real women think or will, real women know that when their husband does say no, that he's only saying it out of love. He's only saying it because he really cares. Real women understand that. And so when you think back to the Prophet Sallallahu when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, at that time he had two wives. He was married to Sauda, bin to Zama, and he was also married to Aisha at that time. So he, left, he leaves Mecca, migrates to Medina. When he gets to Medina, he doesn't have a home, doesn't have a house to live in. And the first thing that he does is he lets his camel go. And he allows the camel, Qaswa, to walk wherever she wants. As he told the Sahaba, Da'ahaf in the Mamura, leave her because she is being commanded by a higher authority. Let her roam. And wherever she stops, that is where we are going to build the masjid. 
His wives are looking at him like, well, we don't even have a place to live. We don't have a place to live. The Prophet ﷺ gave precedence to the house of Allah over his own house. That's prior, that's a man prioritizing. That's important. In many Muslim communities, we look to move towards, you know, these posh environments, these neighborhoods, you know, because we believe that, you know, we're kind of keeping up with the Joneses and we're so far away from the masjid. Right? You live in a nice neighborhood. Got you. Great for you. Happy for you. Hope that works out for you. But you move so far away from the masjid that now you see going to the masjid for the salat as a burden. It's kind of far. So you end up praying in your house. And then after time, because shaitan is working on you, you eventually stop praying altogether. Tell me I'm lying. That's the process. But then you have some people who move into an environment. They find a property. Even if it's a house, we need to make a masjid. We need to have a place where we establish our salah. I'm forgetting the brother's name, that, that, the masjid that we were here for before. Amen. He turned his house, his garage, into a masjid. And then eventually, now it's a place that is open for the five daily prayers. That, that's what I'm talking about. Prioritizing. I'm sitting on a property, I have a garage, we need to pray. I'm going to turn my garage into a musalla and then eventually add some things to it so it's a full-blown masjid that we pray in five times a day. Prioritizing. The Prophet ﷺ migrates from Mecca to Medina with no place to live. And the first thing he works on is building the house of Allah before he even builds his own house. That is the quality of a man. Right? Give me another example, just to make it crystal clear. The Prophet ﷺ gave precedence to the safety and security of his own community over his own title. When he was signing the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah, he took some of the Muslims, 1,400 Muslims, he left from Medina, going to Mecca to go perform Umrah. To go perform Umrah. When he gets to the outskirts of Mecca, he's met by the opposition of Quraysh. Quraysh tells him, you're not coming in here to perform a murder. They begin to sign this document that is known as Sunh Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an entire surah about this incident known as Surah Al-Fatih, the surah of the victory. In signing that peace treaty, the Prophet ﷺ turns to Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the writer, and he tells Ali, write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Suhail ibn Amr, who was one of the chiefs of Quraysh, who was, you know, coordinating the document on behalf of Quraysh, he says, wait a minute. We don't know any Rahman, we don't know any Rahim. What's all this new stuff you come in with? He said, Uktu bismikallahumma kama kuntitaktu. He said, write in the name of God like we used to write. Don't come with all this new stuff. Because they didn't recognize the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they refused, especially Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And this is why Allah says in another ayat in the Quran, Rahman, Asma Call on him by Allah or God. Or call on him by Ar Rahman, whatever name you choose to call on him by, for him belongs the most beautiful names and lofty attributes. It does not take anything away from the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims today, we get caught up in, oh, don't say God, say Allah. Okay, so let me, let me break it down for you. For those who say, don't say Allah, don't say God, say Allah. Because God means dog backwards. We're not talking, don't play semantics. We're not talking about what it says backwards. The word Allah in Arabic, it's an Arabic word. It consists of a few Arabic letters. Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha. Makes up 
Allah. The second lamb, there's a shadda on Allah's name, so it's not, it's removed. Because if you put a shadda on the lamb, that means that you pronounce it twice. Allah. Right? If we separated those letters, the Aleph lamb, which in the Arabic language is called the definite article, means the. That's how you make something specific. That is the book, or this is the book. Al-Kitab, the book. Alif Lam makes something specific. It's the definite article in the Arabic language. Al meaning the. That's the Alif and Lam. And then there is another Alif in the middle. And another lamb and a ha. Alif lamb ha means ila. So essentially the word Allah means al ila, the only God. What else does Allah mean? And I mean like it's sad that we gotta do this because while we are trying to appeal to non-Muslims, which we should be doing, who they understand the language of God, and perhaps Allah, especially in, you know, in, in, in the environments that we live in currently, one might misconstrue that Allah is some God that Muslims pray to. So we have to keep in mind that the people that we are trying to appeal to, non-Muslims, people who are not Muslim, who know very little about our faith, we want to use a language that can appeal to them and pull them in. Why not use God? <laughs> It makes sense to them. And of course, we have to explain that this does not mean Jesus. This means God Almighty, which they all understand. <clears throat> so we get into the semantics. Don't say God. So, so sometimes I use the phrase God. I stream it live. We have people who are not Muslim who are listening and who have actually enjoyed the information that, you know, that comes from our religion. The truth is the truth. There's not something that you can deny. So it's not something that we should, you know, kind of play around with. But Al-Ila, Allah, means the only God. That's what it means. So the Prophet Sallallahu he signs, he tells Ali, sign the peace treaty, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. So Harold says, we don't know this ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Right in the name of God. That's it. The Prophet Sallallahu says, okay. Then he tells Ali, Uktu min Muhammad Rasulillah. From Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Zuhal said, No, stop. He said, We don't know you to be the Messenger of Allah. He said, If we thought you were the Messenger of Allah, we wouldn't be fighting you. And we wouldn't be stopping you from making tawaf around the Kaaba. Right from Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. The Sahaba were in an uproar. No, we're going to write Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. That's the only thing that we're going to write. And the Prophet ﷺ turns to Ali and says, Write from Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. Because it wasn't about a title. My responsibility is to make sure the 1,400 companions that came with me from Medina to Mecca return home to their families safe and sound. And if I have to remove a title from my name, in order for that to happen, guess what? <laughs> Remove it. It's called prioritizing. Giving precedence to what is more important over what is important. And the Prophet Sallallahu turns and he makes dua and said, Oh Allah, you know I'm your messenger even if they refuse to acknowledge it. Meaning, I don't need their validation. The only validation that I need is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. They don't validate me. Whether you choose to acknowledge it or you refuse to acknowledge it. Does it make me any? Never mind. As long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows I'm his messenger, I'm fine with that. You understand? Validation comes from Allah, not from people. When you are deriving your worth from people, then you're going to fight for these titles and these positions because that's where you get your validation from. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Oh Allah, you know I'm your messenger even if they refuse to acknowledge it. Meaning, they don't validate me. Erase it. Right, Muhammad? 
Huh? So this was another form of prioritization. The last example is, well, I'm not going to go into this. I think you guys got the point, right? No need to just keep going on and on and on. All right. Number three, I'm only going to do five. I got a whole bunch of papers here, so I can keep going on and on. And on. <laughs> Number three, uh, part of what, and I think that a son, a father, as well as a husband, all need to master the art of prioritization. I think that is, you know, very essential, very key to being a man. Number three, from the qualities that make a man a man is using his patriarchy in a manner that is empowering and uplifting, uplifting rather than using it in a manner that is debilitating and emotionally debilitating and conquering, right? Knowing how to use the position that Allah gave you. You as a man, you never find the Prophet وسلم, throwing around this phrase that you hear men in today's time throwing around, but I'm the man of the house. Obey your husband, sister. The Prophet وسلم, never had to pull that rank. Never have to use that card. Obey your husband, sister. That's basically, let me translate that for you. Shut up, you don't matter, and let me carry on with what I want to carry on with. That's not the way that it works. That's not the way that it works. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Laysa shadidu bisura'ah. That the strong person is not the person that can wrestle someone to the ground. That's a matter of physical prowess. Anybody can manage to do that. But strength, real strength, is not based upon the physical ability to knock someone out or slam someone on the ground or pull your rank in a situation. He said, He said, but the strong person is the one that can control himself when he is angry. Control himself. Discipline. Learning how to use your position as the patriarch of your family in a manner that is uplifting. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the Sahaba were in the masjid sword fighting. The Prophet noticed Aisha looking out her window wanting to see that. And he tells Aisha, come, you want to watch, come. And he kneels down, look at, this is real strength, right? Because he could have said, Aisha, close the curtain. These are men out here. Why are you looking at the men? Fear Allah. He could have said that. Close the curtain. Go inside. What are you looking at the men for? Fear Allah. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't insecure. You want to look at entertainment? You want to be entertained? Come. You open the door, tell her, come out. And he kneels down. This is a man. He kneels down. Aisha gets behind him and puts her cheek up against his cheek. And he sits there and allows her to watch. And then he turns and he asks her, after some time, you finish? She said, yes. Okay. He lowered his wing of humility. That's what real power looks like. Real strength is not to conquer someone and make someone feel the weight of your authority. Real strength is about paving the way so that people who may not have the authority that you have can enjoy your position, can enjoy what you offer from your position of authority. You guys follow me? Making sure that the weight of your authority, some men just throw around their authority all the time. Very recklessly. The woman has to know that you're the man. I got it. You're the man of the house. You understand? So it's very important that, you know, we don't make our wives feel, you know, the, you know, the weight of, that we don't make them feel the weight of our authority. Gentleness doesn't take anything away from you as a man. The Prophet said, Man kana rifku fi shayin illa zana. 
That gentleness is not put into anything except that it beautifies it. <laughs> gentleness is not put into anything except that it beautifies it. There were many times in which the Prophet ﷺ could have taken a position of where the person felt his authority, but he always took a position of humility and gentleness, and it didn't make him any less of a man. Real strength um, is not your ability to conquer your opponent, but real strength is when you choose not to, even when you have the power to do so. And this even relates uh, to the young men and how he deals with his mother. You have some young boys, especially boys that are sons to single mothers. And they wait until they get to this place of about 14, 15, 16, and they start to, you know, the testosterone levels start to increase. The heart, you know, the, these, you know, these emotions, these chemicals his body is producing, and his mother has to feel the weight of his newfound authority as a young man. Talking back to his mother, ignoring his mother, disrespecting his mother, God forbid using profanity when he talks to his mother, and he thinks that that makes him a real man. Not realizing that what makes him a real man is humbling yourself to your mother, understanding her situation. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Prophet Isa salam, in the Quran, he said, as Isa says in his own words, Barran bi walidati wa lam yaj'alni jabbaran shaqiyya wa salamu alayya wa salamu alayya yawma walidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ubu'athu hayya thalika Isa ibn Maryam he said babran bi walidati I am dutiful to my mother Maryam was a single mother mentioned in the Quran Isa was born to a mother without a father so that means that out of all of the women that Allah mentions in the Quran Maryam was the only single mother mentioned in the Quran. And not only was she just a single mother, she did that by herself, not even with her family. At least Musa's mother, although there's no mention of Musa's father in, in the Quran, but at least Musa's mother had her sister, had, had Musa's sister, who eventually followed the basket down the Nile River to find out where the basket ended up and went back and told her mother, she at least had some help. <laughs> Maryam had no one. <laughs> no one. And subhanAllah, the first quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the main qualities that Allah mentioned about Isa is that he was dutiful to his mother, respectful to his mother. And then he said, وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَارًا shaqiyya," And he did not make me a wretched tyrant in dealing with my mother. Talk about a young boy in the home with his mother. I mean, if some of the four walls of our homes could talk, they would tell stories of young men who abuse their mothers, believing that that is them, you know, coming into their newfound authority as a man. To disrespect your mother does not make you a man. It makes you less of a man. To disrespect your mother, the same woman who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his right along with her right in the same eye. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the right of the mother. Allah segues, he said, and we have enjoined on man to be dutiful to his parents. And then he segues into concentrating only on the mother. We have enjoined on man to be dutiful to both of his parents. And then he says, But his mother carried him in difficulty on top of difficulty. And his breastfeeding period was a period of two years. And then Allah goes back into the two parents. and Be grateful to me and to your two parents. But notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slides that in there. Be dutiful to both of your parents, but your mother. Put the focus on her. The Prophet sallallahu said that whoever seeks Jannah, then you will find it at the foot of your mother. 
You will find it at the foot of your mother. And sometimes young men, they believe that they have to confront their mother with the same energy. Yes, some mothers, some parenting that mothers use, not mothers, but some parenting styles that mothers choose to use can be very toxic. It can. Toxic parenting. I'm not saying some mothers are toxic. I'm saying the style of parenting that they use is toxic. Without a doubt, it can be. But as a young man, you have to realize that that is just temporary. There's going to come a time when you are going to move out of your mother's home. And you are going to move on and start your own life. So that's temporary. It's just a temporary time. And during that time, you learn how to humble yourself. You don't understand what your mother is going through during that time. Why she's in that situation. We just see our mothers without our fathers around and we just automatically assume our fathers ain't nothing. Our fathers don't care. And the mothers, they're stupid for being with him. Well, if they're stupid for being with him, you wouldn't be here. Obviously, they did something right. And you have some young men who will even refer to their mothers as being stupid. SubhanAllah. But it's important for us not to throw, you know, allow, you know, the people that are, you know, in our, in our care and our, they are our responsibility to feel the weight of our authority. Lower your wing of mercy and humility. All right, and that goes for fathers to their daughters, right? Sometimes as a father, you're dealing with a teenage daughter and you're getting a lot of opposition from her. Sometimes just take a moment to hear her out. Take a moment to hear her out. The opposition that a lot of fathers find from their teenage daughters, the opposition is a lot of times due to a lack of hearing her out. There's nothing that creates frustration in the mind and the heart of a child than not being heard. I know because I was one of those teenagers. You're dealing with parents who it's their way or the highway. They don't want to hear anything that you have to say. And it's really frustrating for a teenager, especially girls. Girls go rogue. They don't care. Boys, especially if the father's in the home, he's a little intimidated by his father. He's a little scared of his father. So it ain't but so far he's going to go as long as the father is present. Girls, they don't care. They will get to a point, 17, 18, they go rogue. They don't care about your authority. They don't care about your rules. Take your rules and shove it. I don't care about your rules. Oh, this is your house? I got to leave? Okay, I'm packing my stuff and I'm going. They don't care. And all it takes is for a moment for you to hear the person out. Just to be heard. Look at the story of Khawla bintu Thalaba. When she wasn't being, she felt like she wasn't being heard. Her husband had pronounced the hard, you are to me like the back of my mother. Which was a pre-Islamic way of a man divorcing his wife but not really divorcing her. So he comes back and he wants to be intimate with her and she refuses. No, not until we go to the Prophet Sallallahu to find out whether we're still married or divorced. Khola goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and says, my husband did this, are we still married? The Prophet said, all I know is you guys are divorced. She said, yeah, but Allah didn't reveal anything to say that that counts as a divorce. The Prophet said, hold on, all I know is you guys are divorced. She said, subhanAllah, I gave this man my, you know, my, my child. He wanted babies. I gave him my body. <laughs> I had baby after baby for him. And now he waits until I get older and he wants to do this to me. She said, well, Allah, I will not move from this spot until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears me. Until my voice is heard. And she raised her hand and she kept making dua. And lo and behold, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah to Mujadila. Mujadila is Khawla bin Tutha'anaba. A whole entire surah named after her. Because she wasn't being heard. And the first ayah in that surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Allah has heard 
the cries of the woman who debated and argued with you, O Muhammad, about her situation. She complains to Allah. Allah heard your whole conversation. And she was heard. Sometimes that's all they want is to be heard. I know you heard me. I know you see me. That's it. And that's all it takes for a father to say, you have the power, you are the authority. It's nothing for you to say, honey, come sit down. Tell me, tell me what's wrong. How can I better serve you as your father? That takes nothing from you. It does not subtract or diminish your power or your authority over her. It doesn't. Not one way. You guys follow, you guys follow me? Just to be heard. Allah, first ayah, Allah revealed, Allah heard you. She said, I'm not going to move from this spot until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to me. And the first thing Allah says, Allah heard you. Aisha says, subhanAllah, tabarakallahu alladhi wasi'a sam'uhu aswat. She said, subhanAllah, glory be to Allah, whose hearing encompasses everything. She said, I was in the room when Khawla was arguing with the Prophet Sallallahu about her husband, and although I couldn't hear the whole conversation, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala heard the entire conversation from above the seven heavens. SubhanAllah. I'm in the same room, and I couldn't make out the whole conversation, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is above the seven heavens and heard the entire conversation. You've been heard. Sometimes that's all a young girl wants to know is, I have a father that heard me. He heard me. That doesn't mean that you have to agree. That doesn't mean that you have to acquiesce. That doesn't mean that you have to give in. But what it means is that you heard your baby girl. She's crying for your attention. She's crying for your love. She's crying for you to give her an ear. That's all she wants. A lot of times when you see children rebelling, or children, you know, this oppositional, you know, defiant behavior, all of that is a cry for help. A cry for attention. That's it. If you don't believe me, go home. If you're having this problem, go home. Take some time out of your life. Something beautiful um, that Sheikh Ibn Baz, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Sheikh Abdullah Aziz Ibn Baz, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who had a lot of children, a lot of sons, a lot of daughters. And one of the things that I was, I translated his biography in one time. And one of the things that he used to do with his children is that he would set aside certain days for his daughters and certain days for his sons. Certain days, I believe it was Thursdays, Yom al Khamis, which was the first day of the weekend in Saudi Arabia, right? Used to be anyway, until they, I guess now, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is, you know, along with everybody else. But years ago, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, the weekend, the last day of the week, Wednesday was basically Friday. That was the end of the week. And then the weekend started, Friday, Thursday, and of course, Jumu'ah, then it was back to school on Saturday. Saturday was our Monday. And on Saturday, on Thursdays, uh, Sheikh Bin Baz said that he used to set aside that day for his daughters. They would come over, he would sit with them the entire day. Put everything to the side, no classes, no lectures, no nothing, no traveling, no nothing for my daughters. That's it. Sit with them, talk with them, listen to their issues, laugh with them. That's necessary. That, that is a necessary component. They need that. All right? And it takes nothing away from you, your authority as a man. It takes nothing away from you. All right? Am I, am I making sense? Does any of this resonate? Yeah, man. Yeah. I'll do one more. We only got time for one more. It's I'm telling you, I, I do this. We could do this all night. I'll be here until fudger. I know some of you guys want to go home. Right? <laughs> Number four. It's part of what makes a man a man is to assume the religious leadership in the home. Naturally, the man is supposed to be the religious authority in the home. Part of kawama, arijal kawamuna aranisa, men are the protectors and maintainers of the women. Part of protecting and maintaining your women is being able to educate them as it relates to their religious duties in Islam. 
So quite naturally, this also applies to the religion as well, when we talk about main, protecting and maintaining. In most instances, the woman is looking for a man to be on top of his religion. Why? Because it brings a level of comfort to the woman to know that she's married to a man who understands his deen, knows how to navigate his way through his religion, knows his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and can direct her to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This brings a level of comfort and, and, and satisfaction to the heart of any woman. Why do you think, you know, a lot of women, especially single women, they oftentimes go after marrying imams, or students of knowledge, they want to marry this imam. They want, because when they look at the imam, and you know, it, it may not necessarily be because the imam is handsome. It has nothing to do with his looks. He thinks, you know, he's that guy. He thinks that it's because of his looks, but it's not, trust me. It's the position that you represent. You represent, when a woman is looking at you, she's looking at safe, security, comfort. You're going to bring me to Allah. And that looks appealing to a lot of women, especially those who desire to be closer uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their religion. And it, it doesn't just go on in Islam, it goes on in the church as well. Pastors, a lot of them, you know, missing teeth and, you know, just still wearing the same haircut from the early 80s. You know, there's nothing handsome about you. However, when the women look at you, you represent something that they desire. It's not about your looks. They want comfort. They want spiritual stability. And that's what many imams and religious leaders represent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Oh, you who believe, and Allah is talking to the Muslim men here. He said, Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. Upon it are angels that guard over it who are stern and firm, and they do exactly what Allah commands them to do. That is what your responsibility is as a man. Here again, along with the line of along, along, the, along the lines of responsibility, is to be the religious figure in your home. And unfortunately, you have in many masjids and many Islamic gatherings and conferences and lectures, you'll find many of these, these events overly populated with women. Where are the men? Because in many instances, we have this attitude, nobody can't teach me anything, I got it all figured out, I'm not going to sit in front of another man to try to teach me my religion. But you should. The Sahaba sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Many elders from amongst the scholars of Hadith sat at the feet of Imam al-Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail, who was a kid, memorized the whole lesson of his shaykh off the top of his head. And they would sit at his feet and listen to Bukhari run off hadith after hadith after hadith from his memory. Meanwhile, his sheikh is sitting here reading from a book. Imam Bukhari sitting in the class correcting his sheikh from his memory while his sheikh is reading from a book. So don't tell me that you, you, you know, you're, you're too big to sit in front of someone and learn your religion. The Prophet wasallam sat with Jibreel and learned this deen. The Sahaba sat with the Prophet Sallallahu and learned this deen. The youth from amongst the Sahaba sat with the elders and learned this deen and passed it on to the next generation. That's the way that our religion is acquired. Nobody has it all figured out. Nobody. We learn. The Prophet Sallallahu said, in the al-ilm bi that knowledge is acquired through the process of learning. <laughs> knowledge is acquired through the process of learning. Nobody just goes to the store, buy a bunch of books. I don't need to go to the masjid. Sister telling you, come on, honey, let's go to the masjid. There's a lecture. To ah, I'm not going down to the masjid. And we come up with a million or one excuses for why we don't want to go learn. Or oh, I don't like that brother. Or oh, I don't listen to that brother. Or oh, this people said this about him. Or this person said this about him. Nah, you can save all of that for the birds. The fact of the matter is that you do not want to learn. And the fact of the matter is that many brothers have allowed their women to assume the religious authority position in their households. I'm not lying. <laughs> they know more about the religion than you do. <laughs> and we hate when we're corrected. 
We hate when they correct us. Oh, well, where you get that from? Shadi Muhammad? Now worry about where she got it from. The information is the information. Don't worry about where she got it from. Because then you got, you got the brothers who try to mock them and make mockery of them and because they like to listen to this brother or that brother. And the fact of the matter is she's acquiring knowledge. She's doing exactly, following the protocol that the Prophet Sallallahu told her to follow in order to acquire knowledge of her religion. And you shame her for it. You blame her for it. You criticize her for doing that. But there was... Uh, the daughter of um, not Hassan al-Basri was a, another companion, another tabi. Uh, I'm forgetting his name. Anyway, uh, Saeed ibn Musayyib, right? He was one of the great scholars of hadith, right? And one day he wanted to marry his daughter to one of his students. He went to one of his students one day after a lecture and he said, are you married? And the young man said, no, I don't have any money. Who would marry their daughter to me? And Saeed said, I'll marry my daughter to you. It's like, what? You'll marry your daughter to me? This is Saeed ibn Musayyib. You will marry your daughter to me? He said, yeah, I'll marry my daughter to you. You got three days to go get your affairs in order. He went and got his affairs in order, borrowed money from his family, trying to fix his house up, you know, young guy, trying to get ready for marriage. He's sitting at home one day, he hears a knock at the door. He gets up, goes to the door, he says, who is it? It's Saeed ibn Musayyib. Saeed said, I'm here with your bride. <laughs> Take your wife. <laughs> he opens the door, Saeed pushes his daughter in, there you go. <laughs> Long story short, they do what two married couples do, what married people do. Wake up the next morning. He's putting on his clothes. The daughter looks at him and says, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the dars of Sa'id. I'm going to the, the lesson of your father. And she said, Ijlis, inni in Sa'id. She said, sit down, I'll teach you the knowledge of my father. You don't need to go learn from him no more. I got all the knowledge of my father. <laughs> you don't need to go sit with my father no more. My father, all the knowledge you're getting from my father, he taught me. You get it from me now. You understand? Why are we shaming women for learning their religion? Isn't that what we prayed for? Didn't we all make dua at one point or another as single men that Allah bless us with a beautiful, righteous Muslim sister who knows her deen, who wears hijab, right? I, I, give, you the, I give you the whole profile. I already know. I made the same dua. <laughs> <laughs> Made the same dua, right? But then when we get that woman, we don't nurture that desire to learn. We don't learn with her. We don't learn ahead of her. So that, we, and, and I mean, let me say this. If you don't like that, the fact that your wife listens to me, you don't like the fact that your wife listens to Shadi Muhammad, then go learn your religion and let her get it from you. That's a real simple solution. Simple don't keep saying, oh, I don't want you listening to this brother. He's a stray. I don't want you listening to this brother because he's this. I don't want, well, then you learn your religion and you teach your wife. How about that? Yes, you go and invest some time out of your life studying the religion, investing in that, which is an investment in your own self and your family, and teach your own wife so she ain't got to go listen. You think my wives listen to anybody other than me? No, I'm not joking. I'm dead serious. Do you think my wives listen to anybody other than me? I'm not saying that arrogantly. But I'm saying that as someone who they trust that I know my religion. And if I don't know, I'll go find the answer for you. I study part and parcel because I'm afraid that one day they're going to ask me something that I don't know. I don't want, I don't want you know, as the Arabs say, Sakhata min I don't want to fall from her eyes. I don't want to fall from their eyes. I want to be that guy that they feel like they can go to for Islamic knowledge. But my wives don't listen to anybody but me. Period. That's not because I told them to. But why look beyond when you got everything you need right here? 
That's like the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu going to somebody other than him for knowledge about the religion. They married to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Name, you find any hadith where the wives of the Prophet went to anybody other than him to ask him about their religion? Now, saying that I am the Prophet, so I'm not equating myself to that, but I'm saying that when you learn, if you don't like the fact that your wife is learning from somebody else and you refuse to learn, then you should really have nothing to say. The only other solution to that is for you to go learn your religion yourself and equip yourself so your wife can learn from you. As a matter of fact, that's the way it's supposed to be. Where's the first source of her Islamic knowledge other than her husband? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you men, save yourselves and your wife and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stone. Upon it are angels that are stern and firm, and they do exactly what Allah commands them to do. How do you think that process works? <laughs> Except through knowledge, teaching them halal, haram, teaching them wajib, sunnah, teaching them all of the intricacies of the religion. So this is how you save your wives, your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stone. Through enemy, through knowledge. Nothing else is going to save them. Ibadah is not going to save them. Reading, reading a bunch of books just to regurgitate what they read and sound intelligent is not going to save them. And the only thing that is going to save our families from a fire whose fuel is men and stone, upon it is angels that are stern and firm and do exactly what Allah commanded them to do. The only thing that's going to save our families from that is knowledge. Make no mistake about that. As Ibn Abbas said in the tafsir of this ayah, this means to teach your children, your family, adab, the etiquette of Islam, and to teach them the knowledge of Islam. Al adab wal ilm. The proper Islamic etiquettes and the proper Islamic knowledge. That's the only way that that happens. And I mean, I can go on and on and on about, you know, um, giving out uh, and assuming the correct position of leadership in Islam. And I, I'll stop here because I, I can just keep going on and on and on. I'm really drained at this point. <laughs> you guys don't understand this stuff. It takes a lot out of you. Literally, when I got off the minbar Friday, uh, this, uh, this afternoon, when I got off the minbar this afternoon, literally my heart was beating so fast, man. I literally had to sit down for a second. And although... You know, I'm talking to everybody, I'm smiling uh, deep down inside. I'm really hoping that I don't have a heart attack. Uh, I'm serious. It, it's, you know, it's, you know, we, we don't really think about all of the dynamics that go into lectures and talking. I can't speak for everybody else, but once I leave after giving a talk, I go home and I crash. I'm exhausted. It's a mental draining as well as it's physical. Yeah. Um, so we'll stop here inshallah ta'ala wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslimi kithira you know this this talk was you know alhamdulillah I, I, I didn't want to like dig in too deep uh, with us as men but but sometimes we, we need that <coughs> reminder and I, and I hope that that's that's all this was was just a reminder it's not me shaming anybody not me trying to make anybody walk away and feel bad I just I just want us to be better as men this talk was designed solely for us and I'm included in that. Although I'm the one that's giving the lecture, I'm the first one that I'm talking to. I'm the first one that I'm talking to. As Imam Ahmed was asked one time, should a man give lectures about things that he knows that he's guilty of? And sometimes that plays on your psyche. You say, well, how am I going to give a lecture about this when I know that I do that? So he went to Imam Ahmed and he said, should a man give lectures about things that he knows that he himself is guilty of, Imam Ahmed said, yes, but he should make himself the first one that he's addressing. So don't stop giving lectures, but just make yourself be the first person that you are talking to. So I'm the first person that I'm talking to. Even though this lecture was for the men, I'm the first of the men that this applies to. Many times I get off the minbar, people will come up to me and say, hey, it seems like you were talking directly to you. I said, talking directly to me? I said, no, I was talking directly to me. The khutbah wasn't about you, it was about me. 
And, you know, that's the way that it should be. Because it, it comes off, that's where the passion comes from. Because, you, like, you're looking yourself in the mirror, and you're talking directly to yourself. When you feel like you're talking to everybody else and it doesn't really apply to you, it comes off that way. Very, you know, condescending, very arrogantly, very, you know, it comes off that way. Because you feel like you are not a part of the address. And I'm not just a part of the address, I'm the one that is being addressed. I'm the addressee. Anyone have any questions or comments about what was presented?